My name is Emily Penn and I work for NIMAS. We run the Connect Resound project, which this webinar is a part of. So I'm delighted that you're all here this afternoon to join in what I am sure is going to be a really interesting and useful event led by Grant Golding, who is a highly experienced um, instrumental teacher with years and years of experience of teaching online. I'm going to hand over to Grant very shortly. And before I do, I'm just going to give a very quick overview of the session. As you'll have noticed, you are all muted at the moment. We can't see or hear you. So the chat box is really useful for us to know that you're here. Um, we will have an opportunity to see and hear each other later on in the Q&A section. But first of all, um, we're just going to keep the mics and videos off so that we can all hear Grant. The webinar is going to be one and a half hours in total. That'll be a combination of a presentation from Grant and then your chance to ask questions and make observations. Um, and the whole presentation plus supporting notes will be available to you all after the webinar as well. So there will be an opportunity to go back and check on, on what you've learnt. So without further ado, I'm now going to ask Grant to switch on his video and audio only, and then we'll have a chance to um, hear from Grant and have a, a real insight into online teaching. So it'll be great to hear from Grant, and it'll be great later on to hear from all of you about your own experiences and aspirations about teaching online. Any problems, put them in the chat box, and myself and colleagues from NIMAS will try and sort them out. Thank you. Hi, Grant. Hi there. I hope everybody's okay. Um, it's really fantastic to be invited back um, to North Yorkshire to do this, even though I'm not currently in central Scotland, um, it's a bit chilly up here. But um, I grew up in North Yorkshire in Richmond and um, had the most incredible music upbringing in Richmond School. Um, and I think my very first uh, moment in technology and education um, came across when Gordon Watts, my brass teacher when I was in first year at high school, um, created a play along for Team Brass and from then on it's always been something that I've been kind of fascinated in. Um, my background as a teacher, I graduated in 90, uh, 2005, 2001 and um, from the Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama which is now the Royal Scottish Conservatoire and um, quite quickly decided that freelance trumpet playing was just too kind of hit and miss so I took a post um, working in schools, a full-time post. About 13 years ago um, Dumfries and Galloway Council advertised for a remote tutor um, to be part of a video conference project and for me it was quite an intimidating interview because I was aware that it was the first interview I did where I was against other musicians not just brass players I was against strings guitar a lot more instruments that could have conceivably worked better um, for a trial project like that fortunately I got the job and um, and from then to now, I've logged about 3,000 hours worth of online and remote tuition. 13 years ago, when we started the Video Link project, um, the internet was an incredibly different place. Um, for a start, BlackBerry was seen as the kind of up and coming handheld device. Um, there wasn't much going on in the way of iPods and iPads and things like that. Um, even Google wasn't popular. It was Alta Vista back then. Friends Reunited was the old school version of Facebook. Um, and people's usage of the internet was totally, totally different. There was around about 1 billion people in the whole world using the internet back in 2005, compared with 2017, about 3.58 billion people using the internet. So it's grown at quite a staggering rate and the changes have been absolutely incredible. Where we're at now, the technology for video conferencing is just so good. It's so much more effective, it's easier, it's free, it works really, really well. Um, <clears throat> when we started um, in Dumfries and Galloway, we had to use ISDN, which was costing us £600 a month. Um, and eventually that came on to broadband, which is the kind of systems we're using now. Um, and I use this not only for occasional work in Dumfries and Galloway now, um, but I use it for a, pretty much most of my work when I'm teaching students in Aberdeen University. So just to give you a couple of um, kind of starting points, um, for me, learning has completely changed. The pattern of how pupils learn has changed absolutely dramatically. The way that I teach now, even in face-to-face -face lessons, is completely, completely different to how I used to teach, say, five years ago, 10 years ago. Um, and it's really, really the changes of the internet and, and the fact that pupils are immersed to that kind of technology all the time. 
it still stands by the kind of basic rule that I always followed that everything that we teach and the way that we learn it's 55% visual and um, so that's body language posture gestures eye contact appearance all communicate um, to make an immediate impression that's one of the key things that video link does it focuses everybody's attention so all of your pupils attention is now going to be at you whereas if you're in a room there's a lot more distractions and things like that so one of our first findings on the video conference project was that the pupils um, very quickly had so much more attention and we got so much more done um, so in a half hour session we were getting so much work done we couldn't you know it, the progression was unbelievable at the start um, the uh, a couple of things to point you towards as well for um, just about the kind of the learning experiences of using technology there's a fantastic podcast it's a TED talk um, called unstoppable learning and it's all about um, as a kind of quick pointed to it in India they installed uh, computers without a keyboard into old cash machine cash point areas and people were going along pupils were going along young, young kids were going along not pupils but young kids were going along that had no experience of um, using a computer even and they were playing about and it started when they were watching this by seeing people typing in hello and bringing up the keyboard it eventually got to the stage where one boy had actually cracked a genetic code which was taking teams of experts hours and hours jokingly the person running the project said um why did it take you so long and the boy said i had to learn english i think that whole podcast does sum up to me the power of learning and especially online learning um that it's a real amazing thing that we've got at the minute that we should all be kind of working with and running with so how do we get started um with remote teaching I think the very first thing is to preparation you know look at what we're wearing um solid shades of uh, blues and grays are ideal because the colors that don't bleed um the best kind of people to watch for for if you're looking at what to wear is tv presenters news presenters and things um colors like red bright reds and things tend to bleed in the video so you tend to get like weird blurring off them and things like that so it's best to keep everything as simple as possible um ties as well the ties can be quite distracting without you realizing so things like if you're a guy and you're wearing a tie just be just go for a very plain color um also things like jewelry as well if you're wearing jewelry be aware that it might catch on the desk or on a music stand and those little clicks tend to be quite annoying because the students can't see where those noises are coming from and it distracts their attention away the room make sure that you're comfortable um some of my long stints teaching for aberdeen university can be eight hours without a break and I can sometimes make the mistake in here of sitting on a piano stool and eight hours at a piano stool is absolute torture it really is and that's not even including me playing the piano but eight hours is so hard and so what we've got to do is make sure that we're really comfortable to start with so make sure you're comfortable make sure you can move easily without the chair squeaking so this chair's pretty handy it's quite easy just to switch left and right um check behind you for posters and unwanted signs and light switches um, I've obviously got my big trumpet thing up there um, if I'm sat in the wrong angle it can look like it's coming out the side of my head which can be seen as a distraction um, but I kind of like having something just to you know make, make the place look a little bit more um, you know official and professional things like having private photographs and things in the background um, pupils will want to zoom in and want to look at them and things like that and certainly if they can control your cameras which we had with the, the video link work in Dumfries the pupils would have often start looking out your window and things like that so trying to keep everything as plain and as simple and as professional as you can so that basically the room you could be anywhere teaching so it's, you know this for all instances could be a practitioner of the royal conservatoire or it could be in my home it could be anywhere um <clears throat> sound and movement be very careful about you know jewelry and things like that and background noises as well um certainly when i'm working from home the difficulty I've got is I have a six-year-old and so if he's got his friends coming around especially on a nice day the downstairs doorbell is going all the time and um, there's chapping on the door and it just it really does distract from a, a good successful video link be aware as well that the microphone and the way that the, um, the software now um, enhances the microphone that even whispers can be heard so simple things like if you've got a comment to make um, about a pupil you know if you think oh that was just terrible 
it, it's going to be hard. So be really careful about that. You've got a mute option on every single bit of software now. So, or any hardware, just use the mute feature if you need to either have a conversation with somebody that's outside the teaching space or if you, you know, you need to cough or sneeze or, or whatever. The movements on the screen are completely, completely magnified, um, which can be used completely to our advantage, but it can also be really distracting. So I tend to keep things very simple. I mean, if I'm obviously demonstrating playing the trumpet, I will move sideways on, but I literally have about a 15 degree, uh, 30 degree area of movement that I'm just straight on to the side. I don't tend to do too much because if I start moving around so much, it becomes a huge um, distraction. It's also, I tend to speak occasionally with my hands. Um, you'll notice that throughout this session. Um, when it comes to that as well, I try not to do too much because obviously the distance between the screen and my hands, it makes my hands look bigger than my head. Um, so just being aware of little things like that and how you present. Basically be yourself and try and be comfortable and it, it will be fine. It will be completely fine. Um, swinging and rocking in the chair, a lot of people do that without realizing that they kind of sit there and they're swinging backwards and forwards. Again, it's really distracting because it just, they can't see the chair and they can't see why you're rocking backwards and forwards and things. So just being aware of that. I think one of the benefits to do would be to actually give yourself a lesson or record a video clip of you just talking to a screen and see how it looks so you can give yourself your own feedback. Um, it's something that we did a lot in the early days with the video link in Dumfries because we were under a very big project and we were getting analyzed and, and watched and all the rest of it. Um, we got to see ourselves back a lot and it was really fascinating to see just what you're doing. When you start to teach on video link, it will improve your teaching completely all the way around. It'll help everything. I find that now in a classroom base, I, I do deliberately position in certain places. So I'll stand as if I'm part of a section. I'll stand as if I'm a conductor and I'll work alongside. And, and that's been really good, really good for me. If anyone finds I'm talking too fast today, please just put up a note telling me to slow down. Um, it's quite difficult. I can't see anybody at the minute. So at the minute I'm basically speaking to a blank screen. Um, so if I find I'm rushing ahead, um, please uh, stop me and say, could you say that again? Um, likewise, everything that I'm working off, you will get a copy of it like Emily said. I don't know about your own teaching situations here, but certainly I have a couple of international students. Um, so the timing um, element is critical as well. Um, so for international students, it's that, that like New York is five hours behind where we are. Um, I have a pupil in Canada at the moment and it's, it's quite awkward because when she's got to start the day, it's the end of the day for me and trying to fit in to fit the lessons can be, can be quite tough. The timing of video lessons, you have to be so strict on. Um, if a session starts at three o'clock, it's got to start at three o'clock on the nose. You've got to be there prepped and ready because certainly in my teaching in schools and education authorities, we're roughly 23 and a half minutes per lesson. Now, if you spent three minutes kind of getting the link to work and sorting everything out, it, it, it can really eat into that lesson time. Um, and likewise, um, you know, the, the 23 and a half minutes is very intense on video link. So it's important to kind of pace yourself that was one of the biggest problems I found was I'd be sat doing my work for Dumfries and th every half hour the screen would just bing up and it was a different school constantly, constantly, constantly. I didn't have that moment where I could just get up and have a stretch. I didn't have the moment where I could get up and walk around the room or just get some fresh air or something. It's just, it can get quite relentless. So be careful on how you manage your time when you are working on video link because the time flies very quickly. And um, before you know it, you'll try to stand up out your chair and just fall over. Um, so the online tuition nuts and bolts, um, technology should always enhance the learning experience, not get in the way. And I think every teacher kind of now agrees that the way that we've got technology now and the things that we have are just absolutely mind blowing um, from what we had when we were, um, when we were all learning. Um, certainly when I was learning, as I said, I remember, um, the backing tracks that Gordon Watts came up with, which was amazing. I mean, it was, you could all of a sudden play with an orchestra. Now it's completely normal that you can put, you can go to YouTube and find a play along track to play with your favorite big band. You know, you can find every single piece of music online. You don't have to go and buy the CD or go to a library and, and do it. So I think 
the way it is now for pupils it, it's just absolutely incredible it's such an exciting world um, and there's so much potential as well for learning and experiencing learning and and what we can do so I'll cover as much of that um, and the things that I've kind of picked out recently so as well as this being about video link it's also going to be about um, some of the kind of technology that's out there as well for regular um, music teachers so to get started um, with a video link lesson, it's really important that you've got details and contacts of like the staff on the far site, assistants, technicians. Um, I have been in the situation now um, where a pupil was taken ill during a lesson and you know normally I could stick my head out the door, grab somebody from the office and say, could you come in here? But all of a sudden when you're in a room and you've got nobody there, you've got to make the phone call. Uh, in that circumstance, we were prepared so we could we could phone through and say, look, this pupil's feeling really sick. Could you come in and assist, please? Um, but a really important learning point is to just make sure that you do have all of the details that you can so that you've got as much backup as possible. Um, a preparation letter for the school and the site, um, emergency contacts for them so they can contact me in case there's any problems. There's nothing worse than sitting for half an hour twiddling your fingers, waiting for a, a screen to come up when it's not there and it's not happening. Um, and make sure you've got the equipment that you need um, on site working and ready to go. I would say that's one of the biggest problems that I had when I started working um, laptop based. I was using a Windows laptop and I would sign in at like 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning to do some university work and then all of a sudden I'd get like a four hour Windows update. So it's really important the night before or even first thing in the morning just to get up that half hour early and just make sure everything's up to date, make sure everything's shut off your computer that's going to bing and distract people's attention, um, but making sure that your equipment is up to date and running is absolutely critical. <clears throat> um, so check the audio and video session settings in Zoom. Um, if you click on the little arrow on the right hand side of the picture, um, that's if you are using Zoom obviously, um, you can check the qualities and everything and it's Zoom's really good, it's, it's what I use now all the time. Um, I think there is, Emily's got different software and things that you guys use. Um, so be aware as well when you first sign into a video link, um, it doesn't matter what the software is or what the hardware is, there is normally 10 seconds before it all kind of is ready to start. Um, so if you just even pause just for that 10 seconds before and then obviously you can then start, start your session, it just cuts out from this whole thing of people sat going can you hear me? Can you hear me? And are you there? And that thing where in the space of about five seconds, you've just made something that's going to be really good, just look pretty rubbish. Um, if uh, Make sure that you've got like your backing tracks and things like that. I'll talk about how I kind of manage my online teaching with it. Um, but make sure you've got the sound files, the backing tracks and everything to hand, because even though, you know, right now I'm using my um, the pad on my uh, MacBook here, um, it is quite distracting if I'm trying to talk to you then I'm like looking around the screen for what PDF I'm going to use for that session and what backing track I'm going to use for that session. The other important thing as well is to know who you're dialing to, know the names of the pupils because personally as a teacher I find it quite difficult. I've got, at the minute I've got some huge big groups, um, I've got a few hundred pupils a week that I teach and work with now and I find it quite difficult to remember everybody's name. On video link, the way that I used to do it, I used to have post-it notes around the edge of the screen to point at who was sat where. Um, it's just really important to make that connection is to be able to call a pupil by the name. Um, fortunately, we do have little things on here. You know, it does say underneath um, who's who when we're doing a one-to-one -one connection, but certainly in a group online tuition thing, just to have a little note somewhere, just have something so that you've got everybody's name. Um, and it really, really does help. So during the lesson, an informal welcome and chat just it not only gets you used to the pacing and the speed of the link, but it also gives you a chance if you need to do any preset angles or anything like that. It also builds the rapport and the relationship between yourselves and the students. Um, really what you are doing when you're presenting a video lesson, especially for people who are new to it, is you're kind of relaxing them into it. So if you're relaxed, they're going to be relaxed. It's a big mirror thing. Um, if you're kind of panicking and going, oh, um, is this working? I can't hear this. I, I can't do that. It's just not going to work. It's going to be your half an hour is going to have gone. It's going to be an unsuccessful link and it's just not going to be something that the students will want to come to for the future. I think by being relaxed and being yourself, asking questions, you quickly will just accept that 
all of this technology and things just disappears and it just feels like the person's there the connections there and everything's working fine video link um is becoming more and more popular now there's people using skype there's people using um like facetime and things like that it still is not the best um you know you can see it from tv programs i think there's 90 day fiance that comes on and i saw somebody doing a video link on that and it was just ridiculous they had the camera like pointing just to the nose and the face and you couldn't see their eyes um so just just double check everything check that it looks good check that you've got the news presenter pose and you know that enough of you can be seen um to make an impact on what you're doing if you do have the ability to use movable cameras or different camera angles um I would set that up but I would keep it completely simple um, as, as minimal as possible because again it's a massive distraction um, on the polycom systems that we used to use the camera used to zoom out from me and then it would flick sideways and zoom in on something else um, and sometimes it would just do a weird all over the place and the pupils some of them actually physically felt sick because it was just too much movement happening at one time so I very quickly went from having about eight or nine different camera angles to just having one angle and then literally just turning sideways on and just moving rather than moving too many cameras and, and things like that. Really important as well to clarify that a pupils heard you and understood what you're saying. There is always um, little dips within um, uh, within uh, like the, the quality of the, um, the connection. Um, thank you, John, for that. That's kind of calmed me down a bit. I was, <laughs> I was worried there's so much information to fit into this session. Um, there's sometimes dips in the broadband, and so occasionally you'll get like a little blip, and the people will miss something. Just remind them that they can feel, um, they can ask any question they like. If they've not heard you, they can use the chat box as well. Things like that, just to say, can we clarify? One of the things that I always do um, with my university work now is I actually get the, I, I record exactly as this session is, um, and then pass it on to the people so they can go back and look at it. When you're starting off on a session as well, um, use your instrument, play, and just double check backwards and forwards whether the sound's good, whether it's not too loud or too quiet. To be honest, that's something that's kind of gone away now because the quality of the programs that we're using, it's completely changed. Um, and also seat and position. Make sure that you've got a good position of where your pupils are sat so that you can see them within the screen because it just takes one of them to realize they're slightly off screen before they start like veering off to the side and disappearing off to the edge. Um, it, pupils will play around on a video link. They will play up and we did experience this. Um, the kids in Dumfries are great. They're lovely kids, really, really nice. Um, however, they did occasionally do things as a group where they would all freeze and not move so that I would think the link has dropped and um, it happened quite a few times but usually you could tell because there'd be another teacher walking past in the background or you see the trees in the window moving um, but pupils will find ways of um, having a bit of a laugh and a giggle with a video link um, so just be aware of that one if you are using zoom there's a couple of really cool features in this the audio recording um, element is fantastic and also there's a screen share option as well um, screen share is fantastic because one of the things that we can do is we've got a whiteboard on here so if i'm wanting to um you know just draw something i'll badly write the word hi there um we can use that interactive whiteboard there is software available where we can upload a pdf and we can mark music um, so that it can then print it off at the pupil's end, which is really, really good. Um, but I have listed um, a whole load of different, different things for you to, to look at and use. So just away from the um, video link stuff at the minute, technology and education is, is changing at a ridiculously alarming rate. There was a presentation last week, um, the Education Institute of Scotland um, presented on technology and education and the presenter talked about audacity, which was fantastic. Um, I think if I'd have been at it, I would have been, my legs would have been shaken up and like, but there's this and, and there's this. There is so much cool technology at the minute that really enhances what we do. I think going right back to basics, the very first thing that we all should be using is back in tracks. Problem with back in tracks and video link is, when we play back in track from our end to the pupil, what we hear back has got a time delay in it, so it doesn't work. The back in track for a pupil has to be played at their end, okay? Um, 
the pupil doesn't hear it out of sync, but we hear it out of sync. If we, if we do it from our end to them, and then we hear back. So just be aware of that. That's one of the biggest problems that we've got. It'll never be, uh, I can't see it being improved. There was experiments with something called Lola, which is low latency video link. Um, I know Napier University in Edinburgh have it. Um, we looked at it with the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland and basically it's really good. It means you know you can rehearse in real time and have 10 people around the world um, playing all at the same time, exactly on the beat with no lag and it works really well. The problem is it's massively, massively ex expensive and the, the broadband connection is getting pulled away just for that purpose which, you know, if, they, if, if somebody decides to log on to 20 computers to do a class on computing, it's going to pull your quality away. So, however, it's fantastic. At the same time, it's just little things that we can work around. The delay on video conferencing is the only thing that I think anybody can pull up and say, this, this is not working for me. You have to get used to it. It's the same as a phone call. It's quite easy. Um, and it's, it's not something that I find affects um too much you know it's, it's only really the backing track thing for me but as i say i just get the pupils to have their backing track at their end and then they play it and i can hear it in real time and it solves the problem audio and video clips are fantastic um having everything in a simple folder on your desktop ready is the best way to do it like i said before one of the most professional things i think is when somebody brings up um a desktop image and it's like a picture of the family it just blows all the thing everything you've been trying to do to get good teaching and coaching, it blows it out of the water and distracts attention. And, you know, certainly with some of the areas that I work in, um, the pupils do tend to, to have, think they've got one up on you because they can see what your family look like or see that you've got a child or, or what have you. Um, so I would keep everything as plain as possible, as plain and simple as possible. I just use generic backdrops on my laptop and things. Um, if you are using any video clips, there's some fantastic um, things available on YouTube, like the Rhythm Cafe, which is brilliant. Um, and Every God Boy Deserves Football. That's two clips that I use just so much. Um, they're really, really fantastic. Um, and they're really easy just to share a screen, pop it up. I will show you a video clip at the end of this project, uh, at the end of this uh, discussion. And, um, and you'll, you'll see how simple that is. So Sibelius is an essential for what we do. It's really handy just to put in some quick examples of sight reading. Um, you know, you can use it just to say, look, this is what a treble clef is. This is what this is. This is this is what happens when we put this note with that note. You can play the audio back. So Sibelius is pretty useful on the video link as well. Um, Audacity, GarageBand, uh, Logic, all these things, MP3 recorders, really useful to record students. Um, <clears throat> Obviously, a lot of the time you've got to make sure that the correct permissions are there to do that. But the ability to record these days is so quick. And just to, to have the quick referral, one of the things I do, um, certainly with exam students, is that we look at a breakdown of a marking sheet. So it has the, the, the tone, the stability of the tone, all this kind of thing. Um, the right notes, wrong notes, right rhythms, wrong rhythms, the details, all that kind of stuff. And what I get my students to do is to think more about the details and are they playing the details beyond reasonable doubt and the way we do that is with an iphone and just getting them to record themselves and listen to it back and listen did i do a crescendo there did i hear it because if i can't hear it could the examiner hear it so all my students are using the technology they've got they're using things like their iphones and stuff like that one of the other things that i'm experimenting with at the minute is interactive audiences is virtual audiences so i'm using 360 degree cameras um which are so cheap now, um, down from thousands and thousands of pounds to just a few hundred, um, even less with some of the Black Friday deals. And I use an Insta360. And basically it means that I can plonk the camera in the middle of one of my group rehearsals and a pupil can then go in and watch it with a virtual reality headset and get the idea of what it feels like to be in the band and what it sounds like to be sat where the oboes sit or sit and where the percussion sit. So you can see, use it for the differences. Um, that people have got. So that's a great piece of technology that at the minute, I think people, some people are starting to utilize it, but I think there's an awful lot more on the horizon that's going to be done with that. I'm not sure whether everybody's aware of this, but smart music is fantastic for wind and brass players in particular. There is now things on there for sight singing. Um, there's stuff there for guitar and drums, but not quite as much. Smart music is software that records you and it gives you feedback on what you've done. It tells you whether you've played the right note or the wrong note 
shows you what you need to do and what you don't need to do. Um, if you are going to get smart music, I would have a look at the um, student version only. The teaching version is fantastic, but it's, um, it's really expensive. It's a fantastic, massive, big resource, but unless you've got a whole set of pupils or a whole school doing it, it's impossible. Um, the, the good thing about smart music is you can rehearse a band. Now, I've tried this, and the difference it made was unbelievable. I got my students to go and practice with smart music so they can slow the backing track down. And then once every pupil got to kind of 87, 90% accuracy, I think we, we picked the point of, um, once it kind of got to that top end 80s accuracy, we brought them together as a band. Now we actually did this in summer um, because in Dumfries and Galloway, we don't have the ability to get every single pupil to come and meet because Dumfries is the second largest authority um, council area in Scotland after the Highlands. It's an absolutely massive, massive, Place with big gaps in between it you know it's Stranraer is closer to Northern Ireland than it is to Dumfries um, so it's crazy um, we're currently on big changes to split into five mini regions um, but for the concert this year we wanted to bring everybody together in a wind band and perform a concert so what we did was we used smart music and we got everybody rehearsing on smart music when we had the core of the band together we recorded them we put that onto YouTube let other people rehearse with it and actually the product that came at the end of it was a really good solid band performance where the kids knew what they were doing and it just it worked really well and for me that sold smart music even more to me um your teaching resources when you're working um, remotely and online are kind of critical um the way that i do this now is i use an app called scanner pro and basically all it does is i take a photograph of a piece of music and it'll save it as a pdf and then that means i can then either email it very quickly or I can just bring it up as a shared screen on a computer. Um, so I now have spent the time to do all of my repertoire, which as a trumpet nerd um, has been tens and tens and tens of thousands of pieces. All my teaching repertoire is done like that. It's dead easy when we do anything on Sibelius because we can quickly just do export to PDF and you've got it that way as well. Um, full score is really fantastic if you're working off iPad. Um, if you're not, it's completely rubbish. Um, if you've got iPads, PDFs can be downloaded to the app where they can be marked by the teacher and viewed on their own tablet by the, the student. So if I want to put Boeings on or any kind of markings, fingerings, it can instantly update their PDF as we go. It's really, really super cool. I'm still waiting to see it coming out on a more kind of general basis. Um, but at the minute, if you've got iPads, Fourscore is fantastic. Sight Reading Factory as well is another fab website which gives you new sight reading material, um, all standards, all instruments, and um, you can choose the key, time signature, difficulty, and it just creates a little thing for you. Um, for timing, one of the things that I found really useful, especially timing exam pieces, is an app called Hours and Minutes Light. Um, that it just times hours and minutes, which saves me having to do awkward maths. Um, PDF to Music Pro is really been useful this last year. It's a way of taking a PDF file and converting it into XML, which means it can be read in Sibelius. There's two versions, there's a free version and the paid version. The paid version um, is very expensive. I think it's a few hundred pounds, but it's incredibly powerful software. It's what we used to have with Sibelius, it was like a, a score reading package in there. Um, but this is super powerful. The free version limits you to just one page at a time. So I tend to use that a, a huge amount, especially if I want to edit um, an exam piece and just maybe take something out or put something in and just change things a wee bit. It's really handy because it keeps everything looking the same. Um, Korg have uh, brought out a new app called Cortosia, which is great for wind and brass players. I'm not going to go into it too much, um, but basically it assesses how good a sound you're making and things like that. It's really exciting if you're a wind and brass player. If you're not, um, it's a bit of a nightmare. Um, Fourscore um, is spelt, uh, blah, blah, where is it on the page? F-O-R. Um, yeah, F-O-R, Fourscore. Um, not the number four. My piano's just falling apart on me. Um, the, uh, the other thing as well, sometimes on MacBooks and things, um, we can uh, find that uh, the sound isn't loud enough for what we're doing. So Boom 3D is an audio enhancer for Macs, which is really good. If you're doing recording on your, on your iPad, iPhone, um, sure, do a really good microphone called the MV88. And the last thing to point you towards as well, just for tech, um, is uh, the Marshall Acton speaker. The reason is this is 
This is an incredible speaker. It's tiny. It's got the cool Marshall look about it. Um, Marshall are trying to sell off a whole load of them at the minute, so they're about a third of the price they used to be. They're powerful enough to play backing tracks over a band. They're really, really good. Um, they've put two speakers together, the Act and, and another one. Um, the only downside of the Act is it's not got a battery, but you know, if you attach the power all the time, it's absolutely fine. It's totally fine. The way that I use technology in lessons now, um, gone are the days of having a big fat study book um, that you had to work through constantly. Um, what I tend to do is, like my new students this year, we've been using things like Shotgun by George Ezra and using that, I'll be riding, duh, duh. We've been using that note um, just as an exercise to get strength in the facial muscles for the trumpet players and trombone players. Um, we're also using things like karaoke version and creating our own backing tracks now. Um, using logic, I tend to do lots of little mashups of things like The Greatest Showman and put all the nice, easy things together. Um, and YouTube is the best place to go because really for me, when I'm doing a lesson and a lot of my kind of ideas about technology intuition came from doing video link work. Um, <clears throat> I, I tend to go to what's trending on iTunes, what's trending on YouTube, and then start putting that into some backing tracks and trying to find ways of using it. I've got a very clear lesson plan where we start with breathing. We look at embouchure work with the lips, we look at finger work, we look at tongue work, and I try to link that in as much as possible with like George Ezra's shotgun, for example. Um, I do lots of call and response as well. Even online, it works really, really well just to do some call and response exercises. Um, so that's just a wee sideline to online teaching but hopefully there's been some things in there that will make you kind of go out there and look for new software and new things and and add to already i'm pretty sure some amazing teaching that's going on so the actual video conference lesson speaking and eye contact um being the first thing avoid talking over the pupils um it's just giving them enough time so it's not uncomfortable so you're not kind of sat pause waiting for them to finish and then giving it an awkward long silence before giving the answer. It's kind of just judging it, but just try to avoid talking over them. It happens a lot, it will happen, um, but you'll get used to it over time. Be aware of the, the short delay between um, asking a question and receiving an answer from the pupil, because sometimes you think they haven't heard you, so you quickly go, did you, did you get that? Did you hear that? And it just kind of then tumbles into a whole the video link doesn't kind of work then and it, it, it kind of spoils everything that you've been building towards um, for a really successful video session. Looking into the camera when you speak, um, sometimes it's difficult to know where the camera is these days with laptops and things. Um, obviously, I mean, I've, I've got a green light on mine so I can see it, but um, really important to even just have like a, you know, just a, a stupid smiley face on it or something like that. There's been times when I've, I've worked with people um, where we used to have the positioning of the video conference equipment, the camera was below and the screen was above. And you get people looking up at the screen and talking, which meant that they spent the whole of the time with the pupils actually looking above the head to see what you were looking at. So it's really important to talk into the camera and, and trying to get the camera in the right position. If you've got a separate camera, trying to get it so it literally is the eyeballs of the screen. So the eyes are kind of in the top third of the screen so that you've got somewhere where you can look. So you actually are looking at the pupils when you're talking to them. Um, gestures, if you would, like just talking in, in front of people. Um, you know, if, as I said before, if you do anything too big because your hands are close to the camera, they're going to look absolutely bigger than your head and stuff, and it just is not a good look. Um, again, when I did that, you can see the blurriness of moving my hands too fast, so just be aware of that. Um, it can be used to your advantage as well. You know, you can really direct something and say, great guys, come on, let's get this sorted. There's, it's got all its benefits. Um, it's just experience experimenting with your style of teaching and how you work um, with your pupils to try and get the best out of what you do. Certainly though, I would say record everything that you do, watch it back, watch yourself back, and you'll pick up very quickly on whether it's gonna work for you or not. Um, body language. Again, this is something I always find I have to tell people to exaggerate on video link because it, it's really important in performance is, is what we do and how we look. Um, when I'm talking, I, I tend to go between kind of sitting normally with my back off the chair and and if I want to get an, a point across, I'll lean forward slightly. Um, but when I'm listening, it's important just to go into a kind of a more relaxed listening pose just so the people knows that you're listening. 
Um, because as far as they're away, you know, you could be playing with your phone underneath the, the camera or whatever, but, you know, just trying to really show that you're listening and exaggerate, I am listening. I'm now talking, I'm listening, I'm talking, you know, just trying to exaggerate that idea so that it just brings them into the video link more naturally and it, it just feels much more natural for everybody. Um, it's, it's just that visual clue thing. It really is. It's the visual clue of what you're doing. The time delay, again, it's not worse than a phone call. Um, it, it's just it's just basically waiting and just being patient um, for them. Um, the problem arises when you're using backing tracks and stuff like that, or when you're counting them in as well, when you go one, two, three, four, duh, and there's like a, a little delay. You've just got to be aware of it. You've just got to be aware that there's a delay there. Um, it's not their fault. It's not your fault. It's just video link work. You get used to the delay. You work with it. At the end of the day, I remember sitting with um, the staff at the Royal Conservatoire and um, we were talking them through, you know, there is a delay in the video link and, and I got shot down straight away. Um, and, uh, you know, there the, was one of the other players from the Scottish National Orchestra there and a trumpet player, trombone player, and, and quite a few of the string players. And they said, yeah, but, you know, you can't have one, two, three, four, duh, and there's that delay. And I pointed out when I was sat in the orchestra that after one, two, three, four, there's a massive delay with the conductor. When you're sat at the back, you're always working with a delay. You're always working with this microsecond delay of just waiting to come in um, almost. And so as musicians, you are used to it and you can deal with it and you have to deal with it on a daily basis. So it's, it's kind of just accepting these things about video link, but they are, they're, they're the only negatives that anybody in the last 13 years has been able to, um, to pull on me. The benefits just absolutely blow everything out of the water. Um, it is so much better. One of the key things I always said at the start of uh, video conference lessons um, was listen with your eyes. It's really important for you to look for clues of something technical going wrong. Um, for example, as a trumpet player, it could be that, I mean, it's, it's so impossible to see, but they could be using too much mouthpiece pressure, but you will hear it and you will get some clues on it. You know, clues like when I take the mouthpiece off, there'll be a little white ring there. The lip will look a bit redder than normal. Um, sometimes you can actually physically see the arm creeping as well. You've just got to listen with your eyes. Um, it, it's kind of a, a twee little thing, but I find that um, it really, really, really helps. Um, just trying to think of, I'm, I'm covering everything that I've talked so fast that I, we've kind of, <laughs> Got close to the end there. Um, the uh, different styles of people I've, I've experienced all the way through um, when I've been doing um, the video conferencing project. Um, we started off, we were in really nice little schools where there was, you know, in, in one school there was three pupils in the entire school. There were sweet little kids. They were really well behaved. By the time it got to the end of the 10 years, um, we were working with children that had kind of complex autistic spectrum issues um, pupils that had ADHD and we found that actually it was a really good learning tool for a lot of these pupils because the focus level the focus was so much higher you know the, these pupils needed to be completely pulled into what you're saying and the words to be very powerful and direct and by the way that you have to teach on video link and the way that you have to work it automatically just benefits um, benefits those pupils with additional needs as well as um, the regular lesson on video link, I think sometimes if you need feedback, if you're not getting to see the people in real life, it sometimes is beneficial to get them to record a video clip and send it to you so you can just compare. I think for peace of mind of yourself, so that you're aware that actually they do sound like what I think they sound like, or you know that sounds better than I thought it did. It is worthwhile just getting them to record even audio um, and just send performances. You don't have to tell them why, you don't have to say, I need to just double check that you sound like I think you sound. You can just say, right, we're putting these video clips on, we're doing this, we're, we're just putting together a couple of things, could you record that for me please? And get it sent in. One of the pupils um, that I had around about seven years ago in, um, in a little place in a town called Sanka, just up there, it was a, a teeny tiny town called Kellahome. And um, he came in one day and uh, on the video link, it, I just thought he sounds different. Um, he was able to get through his piece. He was able to get his high notes out. And I think he'd not been playing for very long. And 
we were coming up to Christmas and he was, was playing Deck the Halls of Bows of Holly and, and I said, why did you choose that? Because you're only meant to work on Jingle Bells. And he came back and said, well, I can get the high notes now. And it turned out that he, he basically gone onto YouTube and typed in trombones, spoken to his grandparents or what have you, and they said, oh, there's a piece called 76 Trombones. And he found 76 Trombones and he found Audacity and he um, recorded himself playing the tune 76 times and managed to multi-track himself. Um, over that kind of weekend, rainy weekend in Scotland project, the benefits from him just playing about were absolutely massive, absolutely massive, because he had this stamina now that he'd never had, and it just got him a real spark onto what he was doing. He found everything easier, which meant he could progress much, much quicker. Um, the way that the world's changed with online work, um, I think, uh, I don't, and there's no kind of proof on it, but I feel now as a tutor working with, you know, up, up to about 300 pupils that I've got now this in, in a week, um, I find that I don't ever tell them to practice for half an hour anymore. Um, because we all know that if you ask a pupil to practice for half an hour, five times a week, that they're going to sit in a room for half an hour, five times a week and not want to be there. Um, for me, the best way to learn is by doing and just keeping doing and things like that. My background as a tutor didn't entirely come from being a musician. Um, it also came from being a kite surfing coach and I was the national trainer. Um, so I was in charge of training teachers how to teach kite surfing and kite land boarding and things like that. Um, and it was really interesting when the classroom it was not a classroom, it was outside and the people were getting really good by just enjoying what they were doing. So that's what I always try to take and bring into music. And for me, video conferencing, the two things kind of collided. And when I saw how much pupils love doing it and love working with a video link and, and just simply learning from a screen, pupils hate looking at paper, pupils hate looking at books now, but they love looking at a screen. Um, I found that at the point when them two things it hit, it made me realize that you know the best, the best way to become good at something is just by doing it and doing it and doing it and having the resources to do it. So now I find my, even my not as successful students will go home and they'll research what they're doing, they'll look at the piece, I have pupils presenting me with PowerPoint presentations about classical composers and things like that. And it's totally changed. It's absolutely incredible. For me, the practice situation now at home, what I do say to all my students is um, we split up what they do quite a lot. So I don't get them to sit for half an hour. Usually a pupil can only concentrate for their age plus one. So um, for a 10 year old, it's 11 minutes. Um, so what I tend to do is I look at, I get them to have their instrument, take a photograph of the music on the phone and just practice through the fingers, talking through the music whilst they're watching YouTube or Netflix. And on that little 20 second advert break, these 20 seconds of micro practice, talking it through, doing fingers. I find pupils are progressing a lot quicker. On top of that, the only other thing on a brass instrument really we need to work on is stamina. So what I do then is get them to put a practice mute in and just practice quietly. Lots of very specific stamina exercises just while they're watching the, the Jeremy Carl show or something like that. Um, I think we've changed so much, the world has changed so much to keep up with it. We need to really open our eyes and ears to, to what's going on. Classical music is growing and growing and growing at the minute as far as pupils are concerned. Um, if they didn't have classical music, the computer games wouldn't be the same. And there's some really modern pieces I've done with my band. Um, and I have a band of primary school pupils from the whole of North Lanarkshire, where I live. Um, I have 167 pupils in this band. And um, we do some really, really quite challenging repertoire. Um, but they always come back and they're like, I like that because it sounds like the bit in this game where um, the dragon ran past me and then this happened and that happened. I think it's worthwhile, you know, doing that with our, what, what we're presenting is to kind of present things in a kind of roundabout way. If you want to present a concept in music of, um, triplets find a piece that you can put triplets into that they know and it's kind of bringing our learning a slightly different way um around um and with things like video link it does make it so so much more powerful um okay so just to kind of wrap up on that it's been quite strange um speaking to a blank screen and trying to keep the pacing going so um again thank you john for telling me that that was okay um my final thoughts really on video link teaching and kind of modern teaching now, I would say the very first few months of it, I was absolutely exhausted. Um, 
the situation I had was I stay up just outside of Glasgow um, in the central belt of Scotland. Um, so it's about an hour and 10 minutes for me to get to Dumfries. And for the first um, seven years of the project, I was driving down to Dumfries, um, an hour and 10 minutes, going into the room, sitting, not moving, getting break time and getting my, my lunch time and then back teaching relentless till, relentlessly till half past three, getting in the car and driving back up the road. And I found it was exhausting. And I couldn't work out why it was my most exhausting day of the week. And it literally is just that the concentration is so much more intense. So just make yourself aware of that. You know, try and be very structured about how you're presenting your lessons and what you're presenting in your lessons. Because you will have, in 20 minutes, you'll have a chance to do a little chat at the start, a warm-up, some technical exercises, working on your solo pieces, working on band music, and then some sight reading, and then some fun stuff. You'll have enough time to get all of that done because the intensity of the lesson will need you to fill that time um, because you will run out. If you, if you approach video teaching in the very old school way of saying, right, what did we practice last week? Okay, let's go from bar 37 to bar 52 um, this week. Let's see what you've done. Yeah, that was good. Let's see that. That lesson is gonna get eaten up very, very fast and it's gonna disappear off. So really important to look for as many kind of little sideline projects and little things that you've got in your armory so you don't run out of content because you will pretty quickly start to run out of content um, when you're teaching by video link. I tend to link into classroom projects an awful lot so if there's things happening say the class are doing about Africa we'll do some um, like see a hamber or something like that we'll do some kind of thing like that um, and we try to link in as much as possible just to give them something to do and to tie them more and more into the fabric of the school which is absolutely critical um, in the way that music education has gone and where we're at right now. It's more important that we, we tie ourselves in with the curriculum as much as we can and make ourselves completely indispensable to schools and completely indis indispensable to learning. Um, at the end of the little um, booklet that you'll get, which is basically my notes for today, um, without some of the, the personal stories, um, there's like a little final thoughts and glossary and things like that so it just gives you a few little words that you'll hear as time goes on um, I'm looking forward to your questions and hopefully answering them I hope you've all picked some stuff up I hope you've all enjoyed listening to what I've had to say I hope it's been useful to share um, what's been probably 13 years of the most exciting teaching that I've ever had um, as I said I felt very much in my early days of teaching that I kind of was losing the will to live a wee bit at the start I kind of thought is this it you know, all I've got to achieve is the top of the salary scale. You know, it just felt like a, a crotchet factory almost, you know, pupils coming in, pupils doing exams, pupils doing band, pupils going out. And it just felt to be this thing. And then video conferencing thing happened and it's just really refreshed all of my teaching, even my regular teaching when I'm, I'm face to face. When I did say at the start about the room being prepared, um, Hi Emily, bye Emily. Um, when I said about the room being prepared, um, I didn't realise that something would fall off behind me. Um, one of the um, incidents I had quite a few years back was with Dumfries and Galloway, if I get snowed in up here, um, which because I live just south of Stirling um, on the, the watershed of Scotland, I, um, we, we get hit really bad with snow. I mean the difference between my street and the main road is, is like two degrees colder down here. Um, so I was working from home, the, the kind of background to this was I hadn't actually signed in fortunately to a lesson but I was working from home and, um, and I'll just give you a little insight into uh, a thing that happened a, a few years back, I think it was about 2013. Um, so this was one of my lessons. And if you can imagine that cat on a big full-size TV screen. So really, really important, you know, things like animals. I didn't cover it at the start, but the distraction, if there'd been pupils watching that session, would have just been an absolute nightmare. She had to get locked out in the freezing cold and the, the four foot deep snow. Thank you all very much for listening to me. It's been really exciting to present it to you. And it's been really exciting to work um, with NIMAS. And um, I look forward to speaking to you all in a moment. Thank you. 
Hi, everybody. Thank you, Grant, so much for not just those brilliant tips and insights, but also for your enthusiasm, which I think has given us all a lot of confidence and excitement about online tuition. So that was really, really interesting. Thank you. Um, now, there's quite a few of us in the room. So I'm thinking probably the best way to do Q&As is to uh, type in any questions you've got on the group chat if that's all right to start with, and then we can sort of take it in terms to actually ask the questions of Grant. So if anyone would like to kick off with a question, now is your time. Yeah, Zoom, um, Zoom over Skype. Um, Zoom for me, uh, I, I, I just find it more workable. Um, I think it's uh, it, it's a better platform. It seems to be better quality as well. Um, one of the experiences I had with Zoom was I had people, the way that we use Zoom with Aberdeen students, um, the university students is if they've got any concerns, they know they can contact me at any point and we can do a quick chat or feedback session or answer any questions or worries that they've got at any time. Um, I've got a van that I turned into a camper van and I was basically just driving um, into work at Moffat and then, you know, it flicked up on my phone um, that there was a Zoom, a Zoom call. So I pulled over and basically sat in the back of my camper van and delivered a, a half hour lesson all about nerves and things like that, just using, I think it wasn't even 4G, it was 3G, but Zoom between like a phone and a computer and things just seems to be absolutely incredibly good um so yeah i, I totally re totally recommend it um and as uh, emily's just said she's getting really good feedback on it yeah the backing track thing um can you hear has got the feedback in the looks um uh no if i if i play a backing track um to you um if you just give me a second Basically, all I've got is um, whatever I've got on my computer. Um, so this is just something we were using. So you've got two ways of using it. Um, this is just for a project I was working on. Um, so that's just played through my speakers, but if I do share, um, I can share my iTunes and you'll get a better quality. For that, it's an ambient backing track, so you're not going to get the same effect. But um, if you've got something, um, for example, with a with a beat, um, now if you try to tap onto the beat there, your beat will be a different speed to mine. It'll be a different place for the speed. Um, So hopefully that's answered it. The best way is to, um, you know, if you want to hear a pupil play with a backing track in time, is to get them to play it at their end. Again, something that you can do is just to email them the backing track. Um, most of the time, the kids are working with Bluetooth speakers and things like that. So um, I would just get the backing track played at their end. We can't turn it on and off at their end. Um, but again, handing over that responsibility to, if you've got a group of pupils, to one of the pupils in the group who's maybe slightly further ahead than the other people in the group, it's it, it gives them that kind of learning thing where they feel responsible for something and it you know it, it can all be pulled around to be a benefit for everybody i hope that's answered that one yeah behavior management um now, I think I've actually sent Emily um, a rundown of uh, different different learning issues um, uh, that you can get and how to deal with them. Um, if not, I will send it. There is, I do have a document that I created and it's like how to deal with the chatty student in the group, how to deal with this student, how to deal with different student types. Um, basically, I've, <laughs> there is the element where, you know, you don't have as much control, but you've got to, You've got to ask yourself, in, in the teaching environment now, if, for example, I have a pupil who is getting very worked up and stressed and decides they don't want to be there and they want to get up and go out of the room, 
even in real life, even a face-to-face lesson, there's nothing I can do with that. I can't put myself in the way of them in the door unless they're going to be in imminent danger of like running out onto a road in front of a car or something. Um, so really all I can do is, you know, then ring the office. Um, and that's half the time, the extreme behavior that I have to deal with. Um, you know, for example, a lot of the, the, the large pupil numbers I have are because we're doing big projects um, funded through something called Pupil Equity Fund in Scotland. And the, the people who are in the most deprived areas in Scotland, and in one of the cases I've got an area where it's the third most deprived school in the whole of Scotland. Most of them are kind of sitting 400, 500. Um, you're talking pupils who are coming from extreme backgrounds with extreme behaviours of violence. Um, you know, in some cases we've got pupils who've witnessed murders and things like that, and it, it's extreme. I've got, I had a pupil last year who was on the, uh, really far down the scale um, with behaviour and, and his his ideas and thoughts and things. Um, so if these pupils are kicking off in the middle of the lesson, I can't jump in the way. All I can literally do is pick up the phone and ring the office and say, could I get some assistance here? Um, which is exactly the same as what I can do remotely. I find because the pupils are having to focus on the screen and the pupils are really good at understanding what a screen is and what it does, that actually you really don't get as many behavior issues as you'd think. The most common behavior issues that happen in a regular face-to-face lesson usually come from boredom or fear. Um, On video link, as I said before, everything's moving so fast that the whole boredom element is not there. It's new technology, it's cool, they're like, oh, it's a screen, look at this, oh, that, that's it. So there's so much distraction for them that actually the behavior tends to work a lot better. Um, John, how does it work if you want to stop a pupil mid-piece um, to comment? Um, uh, yeah, for stopping a pupil mid-piece, I, I, just visual, just use your big hands. <laughs> You know, it's, it's not like we've got one of them big foam hands that you use at a football match or something, but yeah, just use the big hand um, or just stop, stop that, stop. You know, you can, that's the kind of power of the big visual thing, not being brilliant for most things we do, but actually for that, it, it works really, really, really well. I'm worried that when this chat log has gone, um, gone quiet, that it's somebody's typing a really big complicated question. I think the fact that nobody has done the, the kind of standard thing with um, with video linking is that everybody goes, what's it look like where you are? What's it look like out the window? What's the weather like? Um, which again is kind of leads on to a bit of a distraction, but it's something we used to do right at the start when we when we started working. I remember we were teaching Finland, um, part of a, it was just north of Helsinki, and uh, we were working with the school there and we said, you know, what's it like then? They said, oh, it's snowing. We got them to move the camera and show us out the window and the snow was halfway up the window. Um, excellent. Oh, we've got another question. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, the, the list that you get has got all of that put into it. Um, the speed shifter app, things like that. Um, now, I might be seen as being controversial here about my teaching um, and what I do, but my background working with extreme sports um, and being an extreme sports coach, when, we, when we're slowing things down, it is really useful. It's incredibly useful for things, but the way pupils learn has totally changed. Um, rather than slowing down a back and track, um, what about them working taking things out of context. So working, for example, on a brass instrument, working on the fingers, talking through the notes. Um, the analogy that I kind of liken it to is that it's like a skateboarder. A skateboarder can't practice a, a, a kick flip, whatever they call it. Um, he can't kick the board and, and do all that stuff and then land back on it in slow time. He can't slow down time to do it. When you watch kids learning skateboard tricks, the way they have to do it is walk through it. So they walk through it and they move the body in a position really slowly so they can see where they're gonna land what they're going to do, they walk through it, they talk through it, they visualize, they think through it, and then they go for it, and they go for it with flow, um, which is a critical word. They go for it with flow, um, which means that they get used to performing and running right through to the end of that phrase, if we were talking in musical sense. Um, is there an argument for we need to look at that style of learning when we're teaching 
musical instruments. Um, because I find certainly one of the biggest problems that I hear for kids on most instruments is that they learn the notes while they go. So on guitar, they'll be like, I'll be riding shot, gun, and done it. And there's no flow there. Whereas if they've worked out where they're going to go and worked along with it and taken a few things out of context, you'll get over this hurdle that appears um, at a later date. I hope that answered that one. Um, Tamsin, do you have any advice for oral tests? I would just be looking for, for backing tracks. Um, again, being aware of that, that time delay, um, especially clapping back rhythms. So even just using something, um, like I've gone away from, uh, from using metronomes quite a lot with the majority of my students. Um, but what I do use is things like GarageBand and I'll just put a drum loop on. I was just gonna try and find one, but um, I'll get them using something like a drum loop um, at their end and picking their own drum beat and then doing clap backs and things like that put a rhythm up on the thing on the on the screen and get them to clap the rhythm back and things so uh, yeah i think as long as everything's kind of based at their end or if you are getting them to play back something or sing back something just be aware that there's that time delay so it's just about being a good musician really to be honest for yourself to be aware of that time delay and work with it Hi everyone. It's looking like there's no more questions. If you have another question, type a quick yes, just so that we know you're there and waiting. If you're typing a long question, as Grant said. I think it's been such a comprehensive overview. It's been a lot of information like I warned you. <laughs> <laughs> Which is exactly what we wanted. Um, so thank you again, Grant. It's just been a, a real infused um, overview of, of what it's like to do online teaching and in so many different contexts as well. I know that um, people in the room and, and other teachers that, that we talk to are, are looking both at sort of individual and group lessons and also those big group lessons that you're talking about. So it's really useful to hear a bit about sort of how you manage those large group situations as well and that it's possible. Because I think a lot of people think, okay, well, you can do it for individuals or small groups, but can you actually teach remotely to larger groups? So yeah. we might be coming back to you to hear more about that, I think, in the future. <laughs> well, great. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for listening to me. Thanks for the invite to do this. Um, as I said, if you approach it with an open mind um, and, and just open ears and an open mind, um, it'll be completely successful for you and the benefits will transfer back into your regular teaching. Um, for me, it's been absolutely brilliant and I really, I've loved every second of those 3,000 hours of sitting here in front of people. <laughs> and a great example of a, a teaching space as well. So that's, that's lovely to see. So thank you and thank you everybody for coming along and, and joining in with this webinar. Um, as we said, Grant's got a, a really good list of all of the hints and tips from today that we'll be sending out to you, as well as a quick survey um, just to let us know how you found the webinar and what you'd like to see next if we, if we do more. Um, there's another webinar on safeguarding and online teaching on the 5th of December, so the registration process is the same. Um, and if you do join the Nine Miles Remote Music Learning Network, for those of you who aren't already members, then all of these webinars are free of charge, plus you get access to lots of really useful resources. <laughs> as well as beautiful Highland music. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to bring today's webinar to a close just by saying thank you to Grant and thank you to all of you and um, keep in touch because it's a great community of practice that's starting to build here. Dumfries and Galloway started it off and we now have counties all over Scotland and all over England taking it forward and it's getting to a really exciting point where lots and lots of professionals are teaching music online and making a great success about it. So onwards and upwards. All right, thank you ever so much. And um, yeah, we'll uh, be in touch with surveys post the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.